Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our council meeting this afternoon. It is exactly one o'clock, and uh, we're going to start with our land acknowledgement, and I'll call on uh, Councillor Uring to read it. Thank you, Your Worship. We would like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on the traditional lands and treaty territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, which includes the Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation and the Chippewas of Saugeen First Nation. We also recognize the Métis, whose ancestors shared this land and these waters. We extend our gratitude to all Anishinaabe and Métis peoples and their descendants past, present, and future, who continue to care for and inhabit these lands and tend these waters. Thank you. And now I'll just invite you to join us for a moment of silent reflection on today's business. Thank you. Is there any uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest? Being none, I'll just remind you, you can bring it up whenever it occurs to you. And we're going to start the meeting today with a special education session. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sid Vanderveen, who is going to speak to us on the Drainage Act. So welcome, Sid. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a little bit about me. I, I, um, I grew up on a dairy farm in eastern Ontario, so I do have rural in my roots. Um, but I spent most of my career with the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs as their drainage coordinator. So responsible for the administration of the Drainage Act and the, uh, the Tile Drainage Act. Since then, I have uh, been working for a consulting firm. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more than just the Drainage Act. I'm going to be talking about the common law as it relates to drainage as well. And um, because although um, you may have limited application of the Drainage Act, or I know you're going through your first um, petition under the Drainage Act, you will have and are going to be subjected to common law issues. And it's important to understand what your re responsibilities are and what they are not as well. So with that in mind, I'm going to get into um, why do we need the Drainage Act in the first place? So first of all, the common law as it relates to Drainage Act, uh, to drainage. So first of all, there's two types of law that we have in, in, in Ontario, statute law and the common law. And statute law are, are subjects that are covered by the specific statute. So the Municipal Act deals with municipal powers. The Drainage Act deals with, uh, with drainage issues. And other pieces of legislation deal with some specific issue. Common law is different. Common law is all based on previous court decisions and the precedents that it sets. So anybody can sue anyone over anything. It doesn't mean that they'll be successful. It doesn't mean that uh, the courts will even hear it, but um, it is the basis or, uh, of our, our legal system. It's the foundation of our legal system. It always applies unless it's specifically been, um, been altered or overridden by statute law. Um, so here's the way I look at it. The common law forms our foundation, and then we build statute laws on top of it, like the Lakes and Rivers. And these are just drainage ones, uh, but Lakes and Rivers Improvement Act, Conservation Authorities Act, Drainage Act, and so on. So there are different things that uh, alter the common law, but it's important to understand what the common law has to say. And you see on that slide, there's two aspects to it, natural water courses and surface water. So let's take a look at natural water courses first. So what does it say? Well, first of all, natural water courses have to be natural. And this definition came from court decisions or an amalgamation of court decisions. A natural water course is a stream of water with defined bed and bank that flows for sufficient time to give substantial existence. Now, why is that important? Um, because there's two categories of water, water in a natural water course and surface water. There's actually a third groundwater, but I'm not going to be dealing with that one today because it's really not related to drainage. So what do the courts have to say about that? Um, well, riparian owners are owners that own land abutting a natural water course, and they have certain rights and responsibilities that the rest of property owners do not have. So riparian landowners of owning land abutting the natural water course, they have the right to drain. 
Now, it might sound like, what are you talking about? You own land right next to the water course. Of course, they have the right to drain. But the reverse of this is the key point here. Any non-riparian landowner does not have the right of drainage under the common law. And if you think about that, how many properties are out there that do not have land that abuts a natural water course, they don't automatically have the right of drainage. And therefore, we be, uh, have problems. There are other rights and responsibilities. You can take water out subject to statute law, but uh, you can use water for domestic purposes. You can make changes to a natural water course assuming you got all the permits and approvals. But if those changes, even if permitted, result in damages to somebody else, you could be held liable for those damages. Um, and, and so that's the common law as it relates to natural water courses. There, an interesting question always in my mind is, who's responsible for managing natural water courses? Um, there are all sorts of agencies that regulate them, such as the Fisheries Act and the Conservation Authorities and, and Ministry of uh, Environment, Conservation and Parks, but none of them are actually responsible for managing natural water courses. And so uh, I, 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 in your handout, you will see there's two um, case studies. I took one out for, for um, to be a little bit shorter, but here's a court case that happened in BC. Now, before you say well, this is BC, it doesn't apply in Ontario, it could. It might actually, because the common law is common throughout um, Canada with the exception of Quebec, um, they may use this case as a, as a precedent for some of the issues that you have in Meatford. So there's two property owners, higher owner Linz, who uses property for agriculture. Beavers built dams on two locations on the downstream property, on the Runge property, um, where on a natural water course. And from uh, for a period of time, Linz went onto the Runge property and removed the beaver dams. I know you're thinking trespass, and yep, uh, that is without a doubt. Um, but Linz was told to stay off of the Runge land. Uh, beavers built dams on the natural water course and started to flood the Linz property to the point that agricultural damages resulted. Um, so what happened? The court said beaver dams are a natural occurrence on a natural water course, and there's no obligation for a property owner to remove it for the betterment of their neighbor. Now, the other aspect of this is, so what happens if the property owners go to the municipality and say, you should do something about this. You should remove those beaver dams and, and deal with our drainage issues because I'm not getting along with my neighbor. It sounds like a cop-out, but it's not your responsibility. Number one, you have no authority to go onto land. Number two, you have no ability to recover costs. Number three, you could be putting yourself in a position of liability. So it's something you need to be extremely careful about as a municipality in managing water courses for the good of neighbors, because it may not be for the good of other neighbors who may see it differently. So now, what about surface water? I kind of hinted at this already. First of all, what is surface water? Um, it's any water that's not in a natural water course. And it really... It, breaks down into two parts. Water that's just sheet flow downhill. You've got lots of slope in Meaford, so water flows naturally downhill. But then there's also surface water that's been contained or captured or concentrated and directed onto somebody else. What does the court say? Well, first of all, the court said that there's no liability for sheet flow that just naturally flows downhill. But a lower property owner doesn't have to accept that water. They can build berms and dikes or whatever you want to call it, some sort of a barrier and stop that surface water from coming onto their property. Now, before you say this is a, this is a uh, crazy rule, that's what the courts have told us. This is not a Ministry of Agriculture rule. It's what the courts have indicated to us. The other thing that the courts have made very, very clear is um, although water may flow downhill, um, it doesn't have the right to flow downhill. Um, and again, don't shoot the messenger. Um, it flows downhill, but it doesn't have to be accepted by the lower property owner. Taking it one step further, 
if you collect or concentrate the water and direct it onto somebody else, now you're putting yourself in a position of liability. Um, so what, what are examples of that? Um, um, well, I, I look at the road on the, uh, on the slide that in front of you and, um, and a road from a drainage guy's perspective is a dam with holes in it, right? You build up roads, you put cross culverts in, what are you doing with your ditches and your culverts? You're collecting and concentrating predominantly surface water and directing it somewhere. It could be in a safe spot, but it could also be in a cornfield like this slide is showing, and you might be in a position of liability. Now, there are some exceptions to that, but nonetheless, it's something that you need to be extremely careful about. And it's not just municipalities. It could be a, an agricultural tile drainage system. Um, I've dealt with property owners that had issues with their neighbors because they were directing their eaves troughs and downspouts onto their property or uh, somebody emptying a swimming pool and they put the outlet uh, right at the fence line and right onto the neighboring property. People don't necessarily get along. And, and so it aggravates the problem. And they'll call up the municipality and say, you should do something for me. Well, what is your responsibility? Your responsibility is only what any act, any statute assigns to you. So if you do a drainage act project, there are certain responsibilities that are assigned to you. Or if you have a responsibility under the common law for a roadside ditch and you're, you're aggravating a problem on somebody else, well, then you have some responsibility. Or if you have a subdivision agreement that assigns some responsibility to you as a municipality, then it's your responsibility to deal with it. But if it's just an issue between neighbors and there's no statute law that really kicks in, it's not your responsibility. And again, it sounds like a cop out, but I'm telling you, um, all you can do is get into trouble when you start to um, resolve these issues. First of all, you, you're paying, um, paying for the work and probably don't have the ability to recover costs. You're setting a precedent because the next property owner will be saying, why aren't you solving my drainage problems? Um, and you, you are spending money that, uh, that may not be uh, what the taxpayers had, had intended in the first place. So surface water can be an issue as well. Here is a, another, this is actually a Gray County uh, decision. It's the southern part of Gray County, and it happened in 1984. But two property owners, Durbecker, who was the higher in elevation property owner, and Lynch, the lower one. Durbecker had some old tile that outletted onto the um, um, onto the Lynch property, but then he did some additional tile drainage work, and he outletted everything twenty feet or what is that in meters? Seven meters from the uh, from the property line, and it caused erosion and flooding on the Lynch property. So Lynch did some ditching to fix the problem, went to fix, uh, collect a share from Durbecker, who had kind of agreed that he was going to pay uh, a share of the cost. Durbecker said, I'm not paying anything. I fixed my drainage problems. This is your issue. Lynch, can, you can imagine, thought, well, I'll fix that. And he built a dam and he blocked the flow of water from coming onto, the, uh, onto his property. Uh, according to the court case, Durbecker went onto the land and opened it up. So he built a bigger and better berm and stopped the flow of water and to the point that Durbecker's newly tiled agricultural land was flooded. And Durbecker sued first and Lynch then countersued. And what the court said, um, it's not a natural water course. That's the first test they went to. There was an original prescriptive right of drainage, which means a long-standing drainage um, exception for the old tile that was there. But once they put in the new tile, once they changed conditions, the court said, Durbecker, you lost your rights of drainage that you might have had in the first place. And Durbecker was found liable. And Durbecker, instead of sharing in the cost of a ditch across Lynch's land, was ordered to put in a pipe across Lynch's land, pay damages. So 6,400 bucks in 1984 is not small amounts of money. And then once that was put in, then Lynch was ordered to remove the blockage. The other interesting part about this case is none of that was done. Um, in 19, uh, 2009, 
Lynch sold the property to somebody else. Durbecker approached the new property owner and said, you got any problems with opening up the barrier and uh, getting the water flowing? And the new owner said, sure, that's fine. So my point is court is a lousy, terrible way of solving drainage issues. And yet it's still so important for you to understand where your responsibilities lie, where your duties are, and almost more importantly, where they're not, where it's not your responsibility to get involved and, um, and where you could be putting your municipality in a position of liability if you do get involved. So that's the, the common law in, in a nutshell. Um, all of that was to tell you, number one, what your responsibilities are under common law, but number two, it's also the reason why we have a drainage act. We are, uh, live in a jurisdiction of the world, as I was mentioning to you, Mr. Mayor, that we have an abundance of water, which is a great thing. But because of that, we have an abundance of drainage issues and we have a common law barrier to solving those drainage issues. And so the legislature, the provincial legislature decided that, hey, if we're going to develop this province, we need to have some sort of a way that we can develop communal drainage systems in a collaborative manner rather than taking everyone to court. And so the Drainage Act was passed and its roots are actually back in the 1800s, believe it or not. So it's not a new piece of legislation. It's It's been around, it's been amended many times. How does it work? So first of all, there's two ways of solving drainage problems, two tools under the Drainage Act. The first is called a mutual agreement drain. And the second is a petition drain. Um, and let me talk a little bit about mutual agreement drains. First of all, I'm not going to read about all of this. Mutual agreement drains are covered under Section 2 of the Drainage Act. And um, Section 2 basically says you enter into a contract. You enter into a contract between the property owners involved. And you can register that contract or agreement on property title. I um, my recommendation was always always make sure to register it on property title because it becomes binding to the land then as opposed to the owner. Um, it's constructed again by a contract. It, the registration ensures that it's uh, that's binding to any future owners of that particular property. So it becomes a binding contract on the land. Um, and they would still have to get permits and approvals. They still would have to go through some sort of a design process. Um, it's usually cheaper and quicker to build than, than um, petition drains, um, but um, they can be diff it can be difficult to obtain an agreement between owners. Um, and the more owners there are, the more unlikelihood there is that uh, it's, you're going to reach um, agreement. If there's any non-compliance with the agreement, enforcement is through the courts and there's no grants and there's nothing that says here's who has to design it and to what standard. So it's a little bit open-ended, but nonetheless, it's a tool for solving problems between um, property owners. It's also a tool for um, municipal road authorities to solve drainage problems as well. So if you had an issue with a neighbor uh, before you say, yes, we'll solve the drainage problem on your property that's that's coming from the road, you may want to say, okay, let's enter into an agreement on how we're going to solve this, how we're going to cost share it, because it's not all the road's issue, and it's not all um, it's not all the property owner's issue as well. So it's a shared responsibility. And then get it in writing and binding on the land. Okay, so now the petition drain process. The, the Drainage Act petition process is, is the process, that, uh, first of all, the petition is the process or step that initiates or triggers the Drainage Act process. Um, it is a legal document that is, um, again, triggers or initiates the process under the Drainage Act. And if it's a valid petition, it could potentially force a drainage system um, let me backtrack. The Drainage Act puts the power of uh, um, initiating a, a municipal drainage project on the property owners that have the drainage issue. And it's a fairly, 
large power. It, it can force a drain across somebody else's property and force the, the property owners to contribute to it as financially as well. Everything under the Drainage Act is user pay. So it's it's cost shared amongst all the lands and roads and utilities that are within the watershed of the, of the drainage system. So um, again, as long as it's a valid petition, it can, um, it can unleash the Drainage Act and force a solution. So as soon as somebody signs a petition under the Drainage Act, there's a legal document at the bottom of the, the, the um, petition, it actually says, you are financially responsible. If this thing goes south, you uh, are going to be on the hook for whatever costs are incurred. So that's your responsibility. Um, the other common misconception is the Drainage Act can only be used in agricultural areas. That's not the case. It was designed for agricultural areas because every property gets assessed. Um, it's commonly used in agricultural areas, but it also has been used um, in, uh, in non-agricultural settings as well. It's usually a harder sell because property owners go, I pay taxes, why do I have to pay to solve drainage issues? And again, um, I hope I, I explained that one with my common law um, discussion. Recommendations to council members, be impartial. Um, you are administering the process under the Drainage Act. So when you get a petition, your job is administer the process. You'll find out later on there are appeal bodies. There are various rights. There's public meetings. Um, but my advice to council always is be impartial, be neither for nor against. Take the attitude of this, if this goes ahead, great. If this doesn't go ahead, fine. Um, it's, it's completely up to the property owners involved. So all new petitions initiated by petition, which triggers the process. Sorry. So what makes a valid petition? I'll go through this really quickly. The act said, uh, says, or implies that if there is an area requiring drainage, so picture surface water coming from other properties and going on to this group of properties. And they're going, I wouldn't have nearly the problem if I wasn't getting this water from my neighbors. What can I do? Well, under the common law, you could potentially sue if they're collecting water and dumping it on you, or you could put up berms or dikes and stop the flow of water from coming onto you. The act gives a third alternative, and that is, I'm going to petition under the Drainage Act. What makes a valid petition? Well, that problem area has to be represented by either the majority in number of owners in the area requiring drainage, the problem area, the area that needs an outlet, or at least 60% of the lands within the area requiring drainage. There is also a right of a road authority where a road requires drainage, and it's not just flooding problems, it could be a legal outlet problem too. So if you did a, I mentioned about roads collecting water by nature, and if you if you did road improvement projects um, and did some additional ditching and brought it all to this one spot, and now it's going into somebody's backyard and you've aggravated the problem, then, you, then the road could sign a petition as well for drainage. Um, I covered that already. So the next steps, and I, I understand that you've been through this already, council considers the petition. Uh, council can reject, has the authority to reject the petition, but two things to keep in mind. Number one, you really need to have a valid reason for saying no, because the act is set up to solve problems, solve drainage problems. And, um, and if you decide that, um, well, I had a municipality say to me once before, we don't do the drainage act. Well, that didn't work out. The uh, petitioners actually appealed to an appeal body under the drainage act and the tribunal, um, the appeal body said, yes, you do. Um, you do uh, do the drainage act and, and these people legitimately have a problem. And so therefore get on with your responsibilities. You don't decide whether or not if a petition is valid, that's one of the first jobs of the engineer. Um, so then council makes a decision and they send the decision to, um, if they accept it to the uh, petitioner to, uh, and other approval agencies like the conservation, other conservation authority, other municipalities and, and others. Um, 
And uh, if it's not accepted, you only send that petition or decision to the petitioners, and then you'll probably get a, an appeal to the tribunal. Um, council then appoints the engineer. There's a section in the act that says the engineer must be fair and impartial. That's a summary, but basically it says that you can't um, do or represent only council or only the petitioner or only some single property owner, you are trying to develop a solution that's in the best interest of everyone involved in this particular project. Um, the engineer has, with the appointment by bylaw, the engineer has a statutory authority to enter onto private land, not something that's taken lightly. So the uh, appointment by bylaw or resolution is really important. And then there's some guidance for engineers working under the Drainage Act that's produced by OMAFRA. The engineer will have an on-site meeting where they'll discuss the issue and what they're trying to solve. And at this meeting, the engineer has to determine whether or not the petition is valid. And, um, and this is who gets notified, the, the owners within the area requiring drainage and every public utility or road authority that might be affected. Um, and um, the other thing that the engineer will do, do as well is determine the needs and concerns of the property owners. What are we trying to solve here? Do we need a tile outlet? Are we trying to address flooding issues? What, what are we solving? And what are the interests in the area? Are there buried gas lines? Are there buried electrical lines? Is there tile drainage systems? Those are the sort of things that the engineer will be asking about. There's an option for a preliminary report um, and that allows different options to be explored. And, um, and then there is a meeting to consider this preliminary report. And uh, that's a, a council meeting. The engineer would present the pre findings, uh, but then the uh, engineer or the council would give the petitioners an opportunity to add or withdraw names from the petition. And if it doesn't meet one of the majority criteria, the process stops and the original petitioners pick up the costs incurred to date. If it's still a valid petition, then the engineer will go ahead with one of the recommendations in the in the preliminary report. And sorry. So then the engineer will go out and do a detailed survey investigation of what's in the area and uh, detailed of of the uh, the the issues that are out there and what needs to be solved. It's also an opportunity to discuss one-on-one -on -one the, the um, project or potential project uh, with the landowners in the area. And then the final report has to include all these things. And I'm not gonna spell them all out, but there is very specific requirements um, of what must be in the report specified by the Drainage Act itself. Plans, profiles, and specifications being the key one, but also an assessment schedule. How are the costs going to be distributed amongst the property owners involved in this particular project? Um, the other thing that has to happen is the engineer must take a drain to a sufficient outlet. So when I told you about if somebody collects surface water, concentrates it and directs it under somebody else, under the common law, they could be sued. Well, the last thing we want is an engineer designing a drainage system and not bringing it to a place where it's not going to do damage. So the act says, engineer, you are obligated, you are legally obligated to make sure you take it to a place where it's not going to do damage to someone else. Um, you, The engineer considers individual property owners needs, but um, that has to be balanced with the overall project needs. And the other thing is the act, uh, the, the project must get approvals and permits from uh, different agencies like the Fisheries Act, uh, the Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Endangered Species Act, Conservation Authorities Act, and so on. So it's not, um, you can't just do whatever you want. You have to make sure you comply with other legislation as well. So the engineer uh, would include a plan um, showing the watershed boundary and showing where the drain is and the property owners involved. And they'll also include a profile uh, showing the slope of the drain all the details to show the community of landowners what they're buying with this particular drainage system, because it is almost a communal purchase of a drainage solution. Um, so the engineer needs to spell all, out all of this stuff. The uh, other thing that the engineer will include is an assessment schedule, and it shows the land that's affected that's in the watershed of the drain, uh, how much of it is there, how much is, is benefiting 
the property owners. So there may be property owners that are further away from the drain. They would contribute based on the amount of water they're generating into the drain. But the property owners that are going to get the largest share of the cost are the ones that actually benefit from the drain. There, so when you, for example, if you were to size a pipe for a watershed, you'll take into account the whole watershed. Um, so when one property contributes, you know, 10% of the cost, they would be assessed a share, or sorry, 10% of the water, they would be assessed a share. Likewise, so on every property owner is contributing some water to this culvert, um, it would contribute financially as well. So everybody in the watershed would be assessed some share. The ones that are going to get the largest share are the ones that actually derive a benefit from the drainage system. Um, there's also allowances that are provided because at the end of this process, it becomes municipal infrastructure. So by paying allowances, the, the compensation is given to the, the property owner for the use of the land, for the existence of the drain, and also for any future right-of-way along the drain. So the municipality, through the Drainage Act process, is acquiring a form of easement across somebody else's land in order to build this drainage system and also for any future maintenance or repair. Um, sorry, and that was a just a picture of some of our... Uh, a copy of a, a report where there was some um, allowances given to the property owners. And then the engineer finalizes the report. Um, it, there's usually an information meeting where it's an engineer led meeting with the property owners to say, here's what I heard from you. Here's what I've designed. What are your thoughts? some final adjustments before they actually take the report and submit it to council. It has to be submitted to council within one year, but that can be extended by council by resolution. And then there is a meeting to consider the report. So the municipality would send out a copy of the report and a notice to all property owners involved in the project, everyone, not only the ones that are um, uh, deriving the benefit from the drain, but the whole watershed who might be assessed some share of the cost. Also, if there's other municipalities involved, they would be notified. If there's um, band councils or uh, conservation authorities or MNR or railways or utilities, um, they would also be notified as well of this meeting to consider the report. So at this meeting to consider the report, um, the meeting is, first of all, is chaired by the head of council and the engineer will give an overview of here's what I discovered. I went and surveyed, I talked to the property owners, I listened and I designed and here's what my recommended solution is. And so then the property owners in their area requiring drainage, the one that have driven the process, they have an opportunity to add or withdraw their names from the petition. If it's withdrawn to the point that it no longer meets one of the majority criteria, then the process stops and the original petitioners pay the costs incurred to date. Um, and so that could be significant because by that point, the engineering is done. If they decide that they're going to continue, council also has a right to um, make a decision. And basically, um, they can make one of three decisions. They can either decide that they're not proceeding with the report, in which case you need to be aware that petitioners have a right of appeal to the tribunal and the tribunal will say, why are you not proceeding? You've got to have, you better have some reasons for it. And number two, if you don't proceed, you have no ability to recover the expenditures that you've incurred to this point. So as you're going along, you're paying the engineering bills. And so you need, a, you need the bylaw in order to recover costs from the property owners. If you proceed, council gives two reading to a bylaw and that provisionally adopts the report. The way I always looked at it is council saying, we agree in principle with the report. And that then opens it up to appeals. The first appeal body is a municipally appointed appeal body, and they hear appeals on assessment. Whoever developed the legislation figured out very, very quickly that by far the biggest complaint about projects under the Drainage Act is I'm being assessed too much and my neighbor's not being assessed enough. And so they appeal to, uh, they want to appeal their assessment. The Court of Revision is a municipally appointed appeal body to hear 
appeals on assessments. And so they can adjust, they can take a thousand bucks off of one property and put it onto another one or whatever the case may be. Um, in order to sit on the court of revision, you have to be eligible to be elected to council. Um, many councils actually appoint council members to sit on the court of revision. And I have no issue with that. That's perfectly fine. My only caution would be if you were a, an assessed owner in the watershed, I would, even though you, sorry, I got, got ahead of myself here. The Municipal Conflict of Interest Act provides an exemption for councillors acting under the uh, drainage act. So you are not obligated to declare a pecuniary interest. However, what I've always recommended is don't do it. If you have a pecuniary interest and you have other council members that can sit on the court of revision, um, choose them. You have to appoint three to five members, three or five members. And so if you have others that don't have a pecuniary interest, appoint them. The second appeal body is the tribunal. The full name is the Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs Appeal Tribunal. They hear appeals under a variety of different pieces of legislation, including the Drainage Act. And uh, so they hear appeals more of a technical nature and also appeals from the decision of the court of revision. So if a property owner said, I'm going to appeal my assessment, they take it to the court of revision, they get a decision that they're not happy with, they can take that further to the tribunal. Or if they go, uh, I don't like where the engineers located the drain, or I don't like the size of the drain, or I don't like the compensation I've been given for land used or um, the right of way, then they appeal those things to the tribunal. The final appeal body is actually the most formal. It's the drainage referee. The referee has pretty much all the powers of a, a judge of the Superior Court of Justice. And um, so they can order damages to be paid, uh, make orders directing the municipality or anyone else to do something. So it deals with legal or procedural appeals. And the decisions of the tribunal and the referee are actually uh, um, uh, posted on Canley, uh, Canadian Legal Information Institute. So if you ever want to fall asleep at night, then start reading drainage decisions. Um, um, the court of revision members, I, I already covered this. If you've got a pecuniary interest, I suggest you don't um, sit on the court of revision. Um, it's important to remember that if council appoints members to sit on the court of revision, they are, when they are serving on the court of revision, they are an appeal body. They are taking their council hat off and they're putting their appeal body on, uh, um, hat on. And so they, uh, have the right to hear the appeals of the appellants. They have the right to, uh, adjourn and, um, meet as a panel to make decisions and then and then come back out and and make their decisions. Um, so and the other thing, if they reduce one property owner's assessment, they got to add it someplace else. So you need to recover the full cost of the project. Um, and there's a, a fact sheet called Understanding Quarter Revision Procedures that's available to you if you get to that stage and you need more information. After all the appeals have been heard, then the uh, council gives third reading of the bylaw and it authorizes the construction of the project, even across pro properties that have been opposed to the project. There have been property owners that have, after going through this process, that have had stood in front of the equipment and had to be pushed aside or not pushed aside, but um, the police involved in order to make sure that the, the drainage system got constructed because it, it it does exist and uh, or the power does exist and it needs to be constructed as designed and adopted by bylaw. Um, it authorizes the levy and a cost to the landowners in, in the watershed, the lands and roads. Um, so you have a way of recovering costs that you're spending, sorry. Um, and it creates new municipal infrastructure. And the, the once it's built, the municipality now has the responsibility to manage it. Sorry, it's um, so once it's built, it becomes municipal infrastructure and the municipality, it, it actually says council is responsible for managing that drainage system. And again, it's you got a picture that it's predominantly on private land and yet it's municipal infrastructure. 
for which the municipality has a form of easement. So you're responsible for the maintenance and repair and, and doing improvements if necessary, assessment schedule updates, managing connections. Um, there are a couple of enforcement sections, and there's also a section that deals with abandonment. I'm not going to deal with all of them, um, but I do want to talk about uh, maintenance or repair. Once it's built, remember I talked about a beaver dam on a natural water course, whose job is it? Once you build a municipal drain, if a beaver dam, beaver builds a dam, it's, it's the municipality's responsibility to to remove that beaver dam and you have the right of entry onto land and you have the right to recover costs. So it's a, again, municipal infrastructure, municipally managed. Um, there's also a section that says if a property owner gives a municipality notice that the drain is out of repair um, and you don't do your job of maintenance or repair, then there is a potential liability if they can prove that they've got damages as a result of non performance of, of your statutory duties under the Drainage Act, then you can be held liable for damages. A new engineer's report is not required every time. Um, you would appoint a drainage superintendent. And in your case, I understand Jessica has been appointed as drainage superintendent. So it would be her job to make sure that the, again, once constructed, that the drain is kept maintained and repaired. Um, and you follow the existing standards in the report adopted by bylaw and costs are assessed out based on the assessment schedule in the report. Improvements are any modifications to the drain. So if there's, for some reason, uh, you needed to make some sort of improvements to the drain, uh, there's a process to do that. I'm not gonna worry about that too much because that's further down the road. You don't have any existing drains, so you're not doing improvements to existing ones either. Um, other management responsibilities, uh, keeping up to date on severances and managing connections. There's authority in the, in the act for that. Uh, there's, there's an ability to update assessment schedules if there's a change in land use. So if you had a, a drain that was serving an agricultural property and suddenly somebody decided to build a residential subdivision in the middle of it, and, and that happens, um, there's a way of making improvements to the drains and there's ways of updating assessment schedules as well. And then there's two enforcement sections. One deals with blocking a, a municipal drain. So if somebody obstructed a drain by, let's say it's a ditch municipal drain and somebody put an undersized culvert in there and it was now restricting flow and, and somebody upstream who is part of the community who helped pay for this drain says, hey, my water's not getting away like it used to. Um, they can call to contact the municipality and there's an, a drainage, uh, an enforcement section under the Drainage Act. There's also another one for damaging a drain. So um, if somebody rerouted a drain or uh, put a pipe in the bottom of the drain, anything like that, it's, it's your infrastructure and you can uh, take action to enforce damages to a, a municipal drain as well. And there's drain abandonment. Again, I'm going to just go over that one because that's not something that you need to be aware of. Drainage superintendent, um, that is your agent to fulfill your responsibilities under the Drainage Act appointed by bylaw. And again, that appointment by bylaw gives, uh, gives the superintendent access to land. Um, it's normally a person appointed, but uh, occasionally a company is appointed. Uh, superintendent's duties, maintain and repair drains, really manage municipal drains on behalf of the municipality and um, provide council and staff with advice and, as well as property owners. Um, we, when instructing the drainage superintendents, we always say, give them advice, but don't solve their problems. If they've got an issue that can't be solved by an agreement, give them a petition form if that's what they need to have in order to solve the problem. But remember, your common law liability, until the Drainage Act invo is invoked, it's really the common law that applies in something like this. And then there's grants. Um, the province provides a one-third grant towards the construction, improvement, maintenance, or, and repair of municipal drains. It's a one-third grant towards assessments uh, on agricultural land. So if your land is assessed at the farm property class tax rate, then it's eligible to receive the one-third grant. 
Um, so that's a fairly easy thing to find out. And um, so when this drain that you're working on is built, then uh, some of the property owners, hopefully most of them will be eligible for the one third grant. Um, there's also a grant for the cost of employing a drainage superintendent. It's a straight 50% grant. Uh, it's not for the individual's full employment costs. Um, they have to track how much time they're spending as drainage superintendent, either maintaining or repairing drains, but also dealing with common law issues um, is a legitimate cost uh, for the um, for the province accepts as a cost that's eligible for grants. And then there's some criteria. So what's council's role in this? I mentioned something uh, something about this already. You have a central role in the administration of the act. Um, when it comes to new petition drains, uh, and I know I said this earlier, and it's worth repeating though, be impartial, be neither for nor against, you're administering the process. The process has power and some people are not gonna like it, but some people are also not gonna like it if it doesn't proceed. So um, you're administering the process, let the appeal bodies and the engineer take the heat. Um, that's my advice. Do your job in terms of meetings, hosting meetings. You have to appoint the quarter revision members. You have to pass the bylaw. Now, once it's constructed, you don't have to be impartial anymore. It's your infrastructure. It's yours to manage. And so, um, you know, you can take a, a, a definite interest in making sure that the systems get managed. And there are a couple of um, training opportunities for council members. Some council members go to the one day rural municipal drainage course, not too often that they go to the five day drainage superintendents course, but uh, there is some training available. So why the Drainage Act? solve drainage problems, common law drainage problems that normally are not your responsibility, again, unless there's some statutory responsibility. It's a municipally administered process, which often are way better than the homemade weekend solutions that are used with their own equipment um, and not necessarily in, in compliance with uh, environmental legislation either. Professional design by an independent party um, ensures a compliance with legislation independent cost sharing, independent appeal bodies that hear, uh, by the way, the appeal bodies, the tribunal and the referee are paid for by the province. There's not a cost to appeal to them. And then there's a, a municipal authority to recover costs and to enter onto land and perform work on in the future. So the act was put in place to override or try to develop solutions to common law drainage problems that couldn't re be resolved by agreement. That's really it in a nutshell. And I think that's it, yeah. Thank you, Sid, very much. Um, any questions around the horseshoe, uh, Councillor Bell? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Vanderveen. I was watching your face kept basically a smile on the whole time you were talking, which was good. You tell by the way you were expressing yourself that this is more than just your life's work. I think it's in your life's blood. <laughs> it's, uh, you know your stuff, okay? And I read your report three times because there's a lot in it. I wanna thank you for coming today and talking to us about this because this is quite legal, it's very serious, it's complicated, and there's financial burdens all rolled into one. I also want to take this opportunity, Mr. CAO, Rob, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from your background as a professional planner on an, on a, an issue that's before this municipality. You gave me personal, solid, good advice. As a councillor, I wanted to help some neighbors I got elected for my neighbors and my motive might have been very pure and my heart might have been in the right place, but motive and heart have got nothing to do with going to court. And uh, thank you, Rob, for helping this municipality. And uh, I really read through this report and the easiest thing from what I can gather is having a mutual agreement that they can they can hammer it out, they can figure it out and do that. The majority of your presentation, of course, was on a petition. And in your report, it even said that 
these drains can go across lands that people don't even want to have happen in the first place. When I said it was complicated, I read about having land on the top, flowing water to land on the bottom, and somebody below doesn't have the, you don't have to receive their water and you can put up a berm. But on the court case, if you put up a berm on a land that's draining, you're in contravention and you're the one that's held liable. I said it's complicated. I got that part. Thank you, though, very much for this. I hope the rest of my fellow councillors have uh, listened to this. We're probably going to see more of this in the future. And I know that uh, Councillor Yurig and uh, myself are on the Gray Solvable Conservation Authority. And I think we're probably going to hear this in that aspect, too. So, again, thank you for giving us some education today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I may respond. Um, I appreciate the comments, um, and I completely agree with you about agreement being the preferred choice. The problem with agreement drains, recognizing human nature, is you need agreement. And, and that is often a huge barrier. Um, and, and so that's the limitation on the agreement drains. Um, as for a passion for me, you bet it is. I, I do think that it's important for, it's an important tool. If we can solve things by agreement, I'm with you. I would love to see more things resolved by agreement, but it's not always available. Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Mayor Kentner. And thank you for the uh, presentation. It confused me all. Uh, you started out saying council has no recourse on anything, then they do. Having said that, a beaver dam, Let's say a beaver dam on my neighbor's property, and I'm, I'm making this up. Mm -hmm. My water was flowing good, a beaver dam built it. I have no course in doing that because it's on another person's property. Short answer, um, if you tried to demand it, then you're right. You have, you have no recourse to demand that he, that he or she remove it. Um, however, you have the tool of the drainage act. And that's the, uh, I've suggested to property owners that if they really won't let you resolve it and you're getting flooding problems, um, inform them that if you leave me no choice, flooding is not an option. If you leave me no choice, I will take the last resort option and I will sign a petition. And oh, by the way, it's going to be across your property and you're going to be assessed a share of it. And that's the power of the drainage act. Again, back to Councillor Bell's point, I would prefer that it be done by agreement, but when it comes to forcing them, the only way to force them is through a, through a petition drain under the drainage act. So if it was flooding my agriculture land, there's a chance I could get it rectified. Using the drainage act, yes. Correct. Or, or better yet, by agreement. That's by okay. far the best approach. And one more, if I may. On page five of your thing, this is natural water course definition, a stream of water with defined bed and banks. I understand that that flows mm -hmm. for sufficient time to give substantial existence. What is sufficient time? Yeah. OK, so when I do my courses, I go, I, you know, when we cover that definition, I usually say I get the stream of water. I get the bed and banks. I didn't create the definition. I just want to be clear that the courts did. And they never really defined what sufficient time and substantial existence is. So there's lots of gray area there. So somebody's idea of a natural water course may be somebody else's idea of surface water, just a swale. Um, to me, um, one of the better indicators of whether or not somebody, uh, it is a natural water course or not, is when it shows up on, on some of the mapping as a blue line. That means somebody independent decided that it's a it's a water course now whether that stands up in court or not remains to be seen but all i'm saying is if it shows up as a blue line there's a chance that you can make the argument that it's a natural water course again that definition i hate it i i um you know it's so vague uh, um is a ravine that outlets into a lake but has a, a watershed of 100 acres um but there's there's erosion, there's clear bed and bank, but there's not a lot of flow. Is that a natural water course? Probably not. So uh, again, I can't answer your question any better than than the courts will allow me through precedence. So thank you. Like for instance, I have a neighbor 
and this is a true story, she cannot touch the water course. And I know for a fact there's only water in that course three months of the year because it flows off my property. Mm -hmm. And then it's dead. So she that is a water course. Okay, so now you're getting into, um, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, if I may, um, um, what you're getting into is um, you're starting to mix statute law and common law. So statute law, there's the Conservation Authorities Act, and I don't know what the new definition is, but the old definition said a CA can regulate a water course, and a water course was defined as any identifiable depression in the ground that regularly or continuously flows water, which is really wide open. Um, it's more inclusive than the common law definition. So that water course that you're talking about is probably regulated by the CA and you can't touch it. Um, so again, this is the difference between common law and statute law. I'm saying under common law, the definition is this. You And the, the, the one point here is you could get all your permits and approvals from conservation authority in, in order to do work on a natural water course and still be held liable under the common law. That's that's the thing. There's there's two pieces of two types of law that are at play here, and uh, that's the point. That's so your point. Um, your point about natural water courses. That's a water course under the CA Act in all likelihood, and that the CA is probably the one telling them you can't touch it. Uh, Councillor Ford. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, Councillor uh, Greenfield. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, a lot of questions. Um, mm -hmm. On page seven, it, it talks about uh, the petition in the area requiring drainage, and it mentions the owners that represent 60% of the properties uh, in, involved. Uh, I, I think right off the bat, you're looking for problems with only getting 60%. Uh, uh, I, I, I guess, okay, five owners, only three sign up. The two who don't sign have the biggest properties. Uh, it, it just seems to me that you almost have to have 100% consent uh, be, be, before you would start something like this. Like, I think that just the way it's it's set up may, may very well be asking for questions. And uh I how how often does this sixty percent come back to haunt the, the whole enterprise? So, Mr. Mayor, um, if I may, um, so the the criteria that you are talking about are are identified completely in the act, so it's embedded in the legislation. So, number one, if you want to change, uh, you might want to write the Minister of Agriculture and Food and say uh, you got to change this. Number two, keep in mind, common law is a huge barrier. You can't modify a natural water course without getting in trouble. You can't do anything on surface water. So the act was set up to be a problem solver. And they said the majority are 60% of the land that requires drainage or the majority in number. And you're right. It, it, I, I sometimes describe the Drainage Act as kind of a bully in terms of solving drainage problems, but it solves them. Um, so I understand your point that, it, you, um, but I'm not sure I totally agree. Like a hundred percent, if you wanted to get a hundred percent of the area requiring drainage of a hundred percent of the owners and hundred percent of the land, um, you're probably going to end up with a lot of common law disputes and berms and dikes built in rural areas, um, because people aren't getting along. So it is intentionally, I think it's intentionally made to get problem solved. Who's next up, Councilor Yurik? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and thank you, uh, Mr. Benjamin, great presentation. Um, I can't wait to go back to Greg Sobble Conservation Authority and tell them the water doesn't have the right to go downhill. Um, <laughs> surface water, surface, surface water. Yeah. Um, so during the process, when you're getting into quarter revision, my, I guess my question is, when it does involve legality, we know that that moves glacially often. Um, is this a unique situation or are we just talking regular courts here? I'm just thinking with a, a water um, dispute, uh, springtime, 
by the time courts get to it, it's, it's not going to be springtime anymore. It's going to be long past and whatever's happened has happened. So is there kind of any expedition on this kind of process or is it natural due course? So the court of revision is a municipally appointed appeal body and there's actually timelines. The um, If you read the Drainage Act and you look at the process, you'll see that it's very much set up to um, to address problems as quickly and efficiently as possible. So after you have the meeting, so let's say your engineer submits the report to you, you have the meeting to consider the report, and let's say you give two readings to the bylaw. The act says the court of revision must be held between 20 and 30 days after you send out notices, which, which happens within five days after the meeting. So it, it's moving things along. So um, some of the provincial appeal bodies move glacially, I like your word, um, but the court of revision should be um, uh, held within within a month after the um, the meeting to consider the report and the report being adopted by by bylaw. Uh, Councilor Porter, and then I'll thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, uh, Mr. Vanderbeen, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm impressed with your uh, depth of knowledge on this uh, mm -hmm. subject. Uh, job well done. Um, so the act is a couple hundred years old, uh, from what you were saying. So um, Meaford it is an agricultural municipality. Question: um, Maybe you can comment on how the Drainage Act has evolved over time to reflect the changes in agricultural practices, technology, and environmental protection. Thank you. Really great question. Um, <laughs> keep in mind that the Drainage Act is a process. That's all it is. It's a fairly um, number one, com complex and powerful process, but it's a process non nonetheless. Um, in 1975, the Drainage Act went through major revisions, and that's at that time they introduced uh, special appeal rights for conservation authorities under the Drainage Act. They also introduced the tribunal um, as an appeal body, as a technical appeal body. They also introduced the, um, the position of drainage superintendent to manage it. The other thing at that time, and I, in the interest of time, I kind of skipped over this, but there's a there's a right to um, for parties, including the municipality, to request an environmental appraisal. Um, the problem with the environmental appraisal is the access, whoever asks for it, has to pay for it. Um, and so it's rarely ever done. And then finally, keep in mind that um, that all these projects still have to comply with law. So it still has to comply with the Conservation Authorities Act. So yeah, you'll be dealing with gray solvable. You must have permits and, and approvals from them, from fisheries and oceans. Um, so that's where it's also trying to um, address the environmental concerns. Finally, um, and I know I know you're really into uh, the early part of the drainage act process, but I've talked to other municipalities before that have hundreds of municipal drains, and I I suggest to council members there is you have some control out of what happens as well. So, for example, if you drive towards Windsor um, and down the 401, and you and it's springtime, and you see some of the equipment. And the equipment is is right over the edge of the the drain, and they're working without without any buffer or back, background whatsoever. Um, one of the things that the municipality can do is through the drainage act process introduce buffers along drains to force the equipment back, and that becomes part of the municipality's infrastructure. So there are a couple of municipalities that I know of that have adopted policies that anytime we do a drain project, a ditch or channel drainage project under the drainage act, we're gonna incorporate buffers along that drain. Um, and that's for the protection of the drain. Um, farmers don't always know it, but it's for the protection of the topsoil on their land as well. Um, and it's also an environmental en enhancement or, or improvement to keep that equipment out of there. So there's there's things that municipalities can do as well. Um, you're, again, you're not at this stage, but there is uh, Norfolk County is up near Simcoe, the town of Simcoe. Um, that's where they used to grow a lot of tobacco and sandier soils. Um, they built these drains and then they realized, well, we're, we're draining too much water out of the soil. And so they have incorporated water control structures, 
little water control structures in compliance with legislation, but trying to recreate some wetlands in areas where it was overdrained in the past. So there are things that you can do. Just remember that the Drainage Act is a process and there's a variety of things that can be built in there. The, the dilemma, what you're gonna have to weigh as council members is, I can ask for all sorts of things, but who's paying for it at the end? It's the same group of taxpayers and uh, property owners. Um, and so keep that in mind as well. Uh, Deputy Mayor Kibani. Thank you, Your Worship. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Vanderveen. I've heard you speak several times at conferences, and I mm -hmm. think now I'll we'll better understand the questions and the answers. And I uh, just wanted to say how fortunate we are to have Jessica as our drainage superintendent. I think she loves drainage just about as much as you do. <laughs> yes. Guess where I got my button. <laughs> uh, I was wondering who gave who the buttons. But I just wanted to share that recently we had a, uh, a public meeting regarding a Bayshore Road, a project that we're undertaking, uh, reconstructing that road. And there are a lot of drainage issues out in the Leith where this road exists. And it was, uh, I thought, really valuable that a number of residents attended the meeting and shared their experiences with drainage in that area and how helpful that was, I think, to our staff to hear the sections of road that typically flood if ditches are backed up and and the ditch issues that are close to a park there and i just wondered if you thought that was uh, you know a common thing that residents often get involved in these conversations and how their experience as residents in those areas can actually help these projects go forward in a in a positive way instead of uh, you know something getting built and then having to go back and and uh, repair whatever drainage issues uh, perhaps weren't addressed properly Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think the involvement of the public is vital. They're the ones that are living with the drainage issues. They're the ones that understand it. Um, at the end of it all, there still has to be somebody at the, if it's implemented through the Drainage Act, there still has to be an engineer that stamps and, and signs it and puts their liability on it. Uh, but if the engineer is not listening to the property owners, who are experiencing it firsthand. I, I don't know that the engineer is truly doing their job properly. So it's a component of any design and I think it's an important component. Well, thank you again, uh, uh, Mr. Van Der Veen. And I just uh, <laughs> share that my very first call from a rate pair was to a flood. <laughs> and uh, there's nothing uh, more upsetting than having your, your home flooded. And uh, so this is a very, very important topic. And uh, the longer I'm involved, the, the more I see how, how critical it is, and, and especially in both, both an urban and rural community like mm -hmm. ours. And I'd just like to add to how fortunate we are that uh, Jessica Wiley stepped up to the plate mm -hmm. and was willing to be trained as our uh, drainage supervisor. I think that's, you know, really uh, the world unfolding like you wish it would. So thank you very much, Jessica. <laughs> Absolutely. I would second that. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, announcements. Um, I think we usually start with our CAO. So, uh, Rob, over to you. Thank you, Mayor. I do have a number of announcements uh, today to share with Council. Um, first off, the municipality's Community Wellbeing Bursary Program is now accepting applications for our 2023 to 2026 grant cycle. Uh, community organizations can apply to receive up to 4000 per year for four years to support initiatives and events that enhance well-being in our community. Applications are due April 21st, and each applicant will have the opportunity to present to special meetings of council on May 8th and 9th. And more information uh, on the application form uh, are available from meford.ca slash community bursary. The municipality's first 50-plus lifestyle and leisure fair will take place on April 20th from 1 to 4 at the Meaford and St. Vincent Community Centre. All community members are invited to drop in and learn about programs, services, recreation, and volunteer opportunities for adults 50 and older in the municipality. Attendees can try a fitness demo class or join in a workshop about fraud prevention and avoiding scams. This free to attend event is an initiative of the community's well-being partnership. The municipality's annual volunteer appreciation event will take place on Tuesday, April the 18th from 4 to 6 p.m. at Meaford Hall. This event celebrates all of the many contributions that volunteers make to our community and will include the presentation of our 2023 Community Builder Award. 
This event is free for all to attend, but guests are asked to RSVP to help staff prepare. I'm also very pleased to announce that Mac Fleming, uh, Mackenzie Fleming has accepted uh, a position as the new recreation programmer. Mac uh, is not new to the community as he's been with us full-time since 2018 as our purchasing agent. Uh, he'll be overseeing the Blue Dolphin Pool, summer camps and year round recreational programs. Finally, um, legislative services team is pleased to welcome Alex Croce as she'll be uh, filling in uh, for Allison Penner as our council and community coordinator position. And Alex is here today, I believe in the back corner. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the uh, extent of my Okay, thank you very much. Uh, other announcements from councillors? Uh, oh, Councillor Greenfield, would you give it to me? Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, on this past Saturday, uh, I was fortunate uh, enough, along with uh, Deputy Mayor Keevney and uh, Councillor Brandon Forder, to attend the uh, aptly named politicians meeting that was presented by the Grey Bruce uh, Federation of Agriculture out at uh, the, the, the Katy Arena. And a uh, great group of people, great group of speakers, uh, 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 folks from the, uh, obviously, the Great Bruce Federation of Agriculture got us started off. Uh, we had a, a very interesting uh, delivery from a gentleman by the name of Kevin Eby, uh, who talked to us primarily about, uh, about Bill 23 and uh, uh, a few of the concerns that uh, that he has uh, with it, and how uh, how it is going to affect uh, municipalities and uh, and conservation authorities. Uh, representatives from the the dairy farmers, uh, soil and crop, the sheep producers, the beef producers, and uh, our own Brian Gilroy from the uh, apple growers. Uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, Keith Reed, uh, one of our residents, representing uh, Alice, and uh, just uh, a, a really good informative meeting. Uh, a number of. Uh, uh, Grey Bruce politicians were there, and we were uh, uh, blessed by uh, uh, two uh, uh, two MPPs, Rick Byers and uh, the Minister of Agriculture, Lisa Thompson, uh, along with uh, our own uh, Alex Ruff and uh, Ben Robb, uh, also MPs. So uh, a good meeting. Glad uh, glad we went, and uh, uh, just wanted to pass that on, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, uh, CAO Armstrong, yeah. do you have something else? I had one more uh, that, that I got overlooked. Um, staff are very thrilled to announce that this coming Monday, a week today, will be the launch of our new monthly e-newsletter. Uh, this e-newsletter will help residents stay up to date on news, council, committee, and board meetings, monthly programming, and updates on municipal services. Our hope with this e-newsletter is that all will be informed and empowered to make the most of this exciting opportunities, events, and services that we have to offer. You can visit www.mefer.ca slash e-newsletter to sign up to receive the monthly e-newsletter. I note to date we already have 170 uh, individuals have already registered to receive that. Uh, so I encourage uh, individuals to go on to receive it. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Akivani. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just two announcements on behalf of the uh, Rotary Club of Meaford. Uh, just a reminder about the Easter egg hunt that will take place at beautiful Joe Park, uh, 12 noon sharp on uh, April the 8th. Easter Bunny, of course, will make a grand uh, entrance and uh, you do need to register those. So go to www.mefordrotary.com. And secondly, a uh, placeholder for the annual spring baggy cleanup, which will take place on Saturday, May the 6th, 10 a.m. This year, people will gather at the Meaford and St. Vincent Community Center. Um, groups can select their preferred uh, area of location to clean up. And if, uh, if uh, any groups or individuals would like to get in touch ahead of time, just to make sure that uh, you get the area that you would uh, want to be responsible for. And you can reach out to myself or Rotarian Liz Harris is here in the audience. You could reach out to either one of us to uh, make sure that you uh, get on the map for that particular area. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Forder. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Uh, also wanted to um, echo um, 
Councillor Greenfield sentiments with regards to the politicians meeting. Um, that was uh, incredibly informative. Um, uh, with regards to Bill 23, uh, it's um, interesting to hear the experts even talk about how complex uh, this, uh, this this bill is and um, the um, um, all of the, the ripple effect uh, that can come from it. So even the experts admit that they don't know everything about this bill. So uh, I take a little more comfort in knowing that I don't fully understand it either. Uh, but I also wanted to mention uh, Meaford's own Brian Gilroy was inducted into the Ontario Agriculture Hall of Fame with more than 30 years um, in the industry. So that's uh, pretty awesome. And he's um, uh, a Meafordite, which uh, very proud to hear that. Um, but just switching gears real quick, um, I wanted to talk about something else. Um, so recently, uh, Councillor Yurig and I met with uh, a woman named Natasha Tucker, who is the executive director from um, mindyourplastic.ca which is a registered Canadian charity um, that helps businesses, schools, and municipalities across Canada to reduce their plastic usage through um, unique uh, educational programming. And uh, whether or not you're aware, less than 10% of the world's plastic is actually recycled. And while we know plastic does have devastating impacts on our environment, worldwide plastic production is set to triple by 2060 despite our best efforts to control and reduce plastic consumption. And that's pretty staggering. Uh, but talks with Mind Your Plastic have already led to some local partnerships. So, for example, the Meaford Homeschool Club, which includes more than 100 families in the Meaford and surrounding areas. They will be participating in the Mind Your Plastic Circular Economy Ambassador Program on April 18th, which will include a cleanup at Memorial Park. Um, and as an advocate for the environment, uh, the goals of Mind Your Plastic really do echo my own. And uh, we're currently looking into uh, all possible uh, possible initiatives that will help reduce plastic waste within our municipality. So I'm hopeful to have some updates uh, on where that's going within the next few weeks. Thank you. Councillor Bell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this Thursday, uh, the Farm Safety Association, Gray County, is having its education and awareness uh, dinner, get together. Uh, the invitation has been extended to uh, mayors and deputy mayors of uh, the municipalities in Gray County. And uh, we are hoping that uh, both of you can attend. And if you can't, to uh, notify us that uh, we can let the uh, food provider, uh, you know, know how many places to uh, make settings for. And uh, we're going to have uh, a guest speaker talk about uh, issues uh, in the farming community with mental health. And I think it's uh, uh, I think it's a top shelf uh, conversation to have, and there will be uh, someone doing a uh, presentation on just what uh, farm safety does uh, when we go out various places. So that's this uh, Thursday. Get together at five thirty in the mill at six. Any other uh, announcements? <clears throat> Seeing none, we'll move into the public participation portion of uh, today's meeting. Members of the public are encouraged to provide council with their comments and questions. If a member of the public wishes to make a deputation on items on the council agenda or to ask a public question of council, they may do so either in person at the council chambers or remotely via Zoom, phone or internet. Members of the public wishing to make a deputation or ask a public question must register in advance with legislative services by 10 a.m. on the morning of uh, the council meeting by contacting the deputy clerk at meaford.ca. Uh, the phone number is 519-538-1060, extension 1100. An email with access information will then be sent to those who register for remote participation. Also, the public can watch this meeting via uh, the Municipality of Meaford's YouTube channel at www.meaford.ca slash YouTube. And today we have a presentation, and I'd like to welcome Diane Hilliard of Imagine Meaford for an update and, and also acknowledge uh, your cheering section. So <laughs> I know. I brought my friends, uh, always with a little help from my friends. So thank you. I'm just going to lower that bit. And is there a an advance. Ah, very good. Oh, it's very touchy. Okay. I'm very touchy too. <laughs> okay, Diane, speak right into the microphone. Maybe oh, bring it sorry. down a bit there. Okay. Is good. that Thank a little you. better? Very good. Hello. 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 Mayor Kentner, members of council and staff, good afternoon. My name is Diane Hilliard, and I'm here on behalf of my friends at Imagine Me First. So as you see, I did bring a cheering section. I'm very lucky that I'm not alone. And I have a feeling we have two remote guests watching from Costa Rica. You may know Reed and Petra Barrett. So I'm sure they're watching too. 
I want to thank you very much for allowing us to make this presentation to Council today. This April actually marks two years of Imagine Meaford's uh, advocacy for smart and responsible development in our community. We appreciate this opportunity to tell you a little bit about us, how we came to be, and how we see our group being involved in Meaford's future growth. Let's see. Voila. Who are we? We are a collective of like-minded volunteers. We care deeply about the future of Meaford. We are not an anti-development group, and we share a mission of advocating for good, responsible growth in the municipality of Meaford. As you can see, we are volunteers, and that is the key word. We are not a non-for-profit. We do not have a board, nor do we have a membership. We are simply a group of citizens who love Meaford and who have come together with a shared mission of advocating for good growth. We are not anti-development. As you know, in thriving municipalities around Ontario, growth is happening and growth is important. We define good growth as development that respects our official plan, a document you just approved or a revised version in uh, November, and it protects the key elements of our community that make it so special. Did I skip ahead? Wow, it is. <laughs> okay, noted again. We are from all areas of Meaford, from rural to urban, and we include descendants of original settlers, longtime homeowners, newly transplanted residents, and vacation property owners. We are entrepreneurs, current and retired professionals, employers, tradespeople, and students with a wealth of knowledge and experience in such skill sets as planning, development, marketing, interior design, engineering, economic development, communications, forgot law, and event management. Our core members are truly a diverse group. Some of us are longtime residents. Others have discovered this jewel of a municipality as weekenders. Still others have moved here full-time in recent years for a more civilized pace of life. We have a range of interests and skill sets that have been put to good use in the public planning process. And many of us actually have direct experience in planning and development. We are engaged citizens serving on boards yeah, of community institutions and service organizations including me for General Hospital, the Rotary Club, and the Chamber of Commerce. We engage other citizens through our communication with our 300 plus friends of Imagine Meaford. We try to be respectful, positive, and solutions-based, and we are nonpartisan. Our core members are deeply invested in the health and well-being of this community. We understand and support the need for managed growth including housing developments and new commercial ventures. As advocates for well-planned smart growth, we have fielded more than 1,800 incoming emails and sent more than 900 notes to residents, staff, developers, and other stakeholders combined. Remember, we're just a volunteer group. We aim to present solutions to problems in a respectful manner, and we are not affiliated with any political party nor did we endorse any candidate during last year's municipal election. No, nope. very good. So who are we? This is the future of Meaford right here. These are our core members. We've had many inquiries as to the membership of Imagine Meaford. So here we are, this is the core group. Reed and Petra Barrett, Evelyn Dean, Eric Ennis, Catherine Haggart, Elizabeth Harris, myself, Rick and Shirley Riordan, Kimberly and Vince Rogers, Lori Stevens, Jim Sullivan, Perry Taylor, spelling error, my apology, and Susan Taylor. When we first launched Imagine Meaford, we had a public Zoom presentation and invited the community to get to know us. We actually had over 250 live viewers, which is a lot, uh, of that meeting. And over the last two years, many of us have deputed publicly for Imagine Meaford on Loon Call, on the official plan, or on SkyDev. So how did we come to be? Loon Call was our official wake-up call. 
In our first year of being, we learned that through the Loon Call development application process, that there is indeed an opportunity for residents to make a difference when working with planning, sorry, when working with planning staff and a developer. After meeting with CAO Rob Armstrong and the developer, the site plan was reduced from 249 tightly packed housing units to a more reasonable 203 housing units. It was community consultation at its best. Then came Skydev. Following our advocacy work on Loon Call, we turned our attention to Knights Harbor, also known as Skydev. We were successful in engaging the municipality and Skydev to consider principles of good design for the proposed development. Our work on encouraging better design for the Skydev development was intensive. Nespa? <laughs> we held one-on-one -on -one conversations with some of our then sitting councillors and mayor. We held meetings with the CAO and the developer. We presented concepts for consideration to Skydev and to the planning staff. And most importantly, we encouraged the citizens of Meaford to take part in the public meetings, to voice their concerns and present ideas to make the proposal a better plan. We presented these design principles based on the official plan to Skydev and to staff. This chart is excellent and it can still be found on our website, by the way. These principles addressed a number of concerns about the initial proposed plan. First and foremost, the proposal did not respect Meaford's official plan in many ways. Second, the layout of the development actually acted as a barrier to residents who wanted to continue to enjoy the waterfront. And of course, other concerns included the density of the development, the height of the buildings, a lack of green space, and whether the, the municipal roads would be able to handle the inevitable increase in traffic. All of these principles aim to address those concerns and more. Many of these principles were actually incorporated into the final design. Now we know that Skydev isn't perfect, but it is better. And that's thanks to widespread community advocacy for better design. To its credit, Skydev did come back with a second proposal that incorporated several changes suggested by Imagine Meaford. Changes that included a reduction in the number of residential units. It went from 206 to 169. A height limit on multi-residential and stacked townhome buildings of 12 meters and not more than four stories. In addition, a maximum two-story limit on townhouses on Fuller and Boucher streets to ensure compatibility with the existing homes. The requirement of a seven and a half meter setback from the municipally owned lands to minimize the visual impact of the development, particularly from the water side, and to ensure that the public was not alienated from this public space by mistaking it for private lands. The phasing of the development to ensure that the hotel and two-story townhomes are built in phase one prior to the completion of the remaining residential portion. Increased access to public, sorry, increased public access to the waterfront via a widely publicly accessible walkway or promenade through the site to the waterfront. And most notable, placing the waterfront buildings perpendicular to the water so that they don't appear as a barrier to the waterfront. The official plan review process. We took part by attending workshops and public meetings and by deputing in person or in writing. Through our website, emails and advertisements in the Meaford Independent, we encouraged all residents to speak up, write and show up to have their voices heard. We viewed the official plan review as an excellent opportunity for the residents of Meaford to help shape the policies that will guide our growth in the next 10 years. Given the critical role of this, develop, this document plays in planning growth, Imagine Meaford members were always highly involved in the public process in a variety of ways. And we strongly encouraged others to take part too. We promoted the municipality's public workshops and meetings on our website, through emails, and through an ad we placed in the Meaford Independent. So what's the future for Imagine Meaford? This, oh, yes. We continue to share, sorry, I think I've lost a page here. 
did I, did I miss one? I did miss one too. Any particular plan with you? Okay. This map, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this map is dated March, 2021. It's two years old. I would like to note that there is a link on the meford.ca website to a new interactive map. However, several of us have tried on several occasions and unfortunately the link does not work. So please keep in mind, this is a dated image, but even as it is, and as we look ahead to the future, it's clear Meaford will experience significant growth and further interest from developers. And for a good reason, it's a jewel on the shores of Georgian Bay that others too are, described, are discovering, just as we have. Preserving our jewel while encouraging good development will be a challenging task for council and staff. There we go. So what is the future for Imagine Meaford? We will continue to share a desire to preserve and protect our jewel on Georgian Bay through smart, responsible growth and development. And we remain committed to this mission. We want you to know that our core members are as engaged as ever in promoting good, smart growth. We continue to be called upon for advocacy for good development. We continue to entertain widespread interest in our activities from citizens across the municipality. And we are committed to keeping them informed on matters of interest. We ultimately have two goals, to work respectfully and collaboratively with our elected representatives, staff and developers to help shape the future of our community and to promote and foster community engagement in the planning and development process in Meaford. Meaford is a wonderful place to live, work and play, as you all know, and we must work together to preserve all that we love about our municipality while supporting good, smart growth. Thank you very much for providing me and my friends the time today to present. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are. Yes, Mr. around Mayor. the horseshoe, some questions for Diane, no comments, um, Deputy Mayor Keveny. Thank you, Your Worship, and not a question, but just a comment. I just wanted to thank you, Diane, and your team for being here today and for all that you have done. You are making a difference, and please know it is appreciated. And I think I can speak for everyone in saying that we do look forward to uh, continuing to work with you as more developments come uh, before this uh, municipality, and together we will make Meaford a better place. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. May I just add, I do want to introduce the fine people that came today. So please, Shirley Riordan, who is our creative genius. So all of those magnificent images that you see are, are Shirley, Liz Harris, our Rotarian, Evelyn Dean, Jim Sullivan, Kimberly and Vince Rogers. Well, Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming out. And a uh, uh, question now from uh, uh, Councillor Bell. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'll take this opportunity to uh, talk to uh, Imagine Meaford. Um, as sometimes during council meetings, folks come out early and then they leave. And this afternoon in our council, Councillor Greenfield has something that he's bringing forward. And I just want to uh, show this to you folks. I was on the working group that did our new chain of office. And I just want to mention that our motto is our heritage and our future. Councillor Greenfield is bringing something forward about our heritage and you folks are working with our future. And so you fit with our coat of arms and our new symbol. So thank you. Thank you, that's wonderful news. I, sorry, did, did you wanna to speak Tori? Um, thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to comment on our GIS mapping for the um, active developments. Um, it, it should be working on our website. We did have an issue with our GIS last week, if that's when you were trying to get on. Yes. Um, so if you are having issues, please let us know because I have it open right now. So it's working for us. Um, so if it's not working for you, um, we just need to know that because um, otherwise we won't be able to. Fix so it, it was so. not working as of this morning and yesterday. I'm sorry. We tried it on a Mac and an and I don't know. Okay. Um yeah, if you can just reach out to me, then we'll get it working for you because um there must be something happening. So <laughs> um we can figure out what that is and get it up for you guys. That would be terrific. Thank you. 
And if I can just uh, have a parting word, uh, the uh, motion that uh, Councillor Greenfield is introducing today is uh, very important, and I hope you will uh, get behind uh, what we're trying to do and uh, and be supportive. And I just thank you, thank you. Uh, I believe that uh, Meaford is so fortunate to have this. I, I I just don't want to dignify your group with the name ratepayer organization because they don't have a great reputation. But uh, you are the ideal of what a, a community group in support of council should be. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, councillors. Are there any public questions uh, today? Okay, uh, then council inquiries at this point. Council inquiries, uh, councillor Yuri. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, did want to bring up just one thing. I wanted to direct to Rob Armstrong, our CAO, just a little clarity. Um, I know on April 17th coming, uh, there's going to be um, information brought forth about TCE. Uh, but just I would like to kind of clarify how council is going to be kept apprised on a regular basis of the progress of the TCE project discussions. Um, obviously, as this very, very important project moves forward, there's going to be many negotiations and many processes are going to happen. It's going to be very uh, long and ongoing. We just want to make sure kind of how that is going to work on a on a keeping council apprised and and through us, obviously general public. Uh, th thank you uh, for the question through your rear. Um, that's correct. We hope to bring uh, a report to council on April 17th. It's subject to getting uh, the proposal. Um, primary purpose is to bring forward to council for approval of uh, someone to act as our uh, project manager, as well as the uh, community benefits negotiator. I think we've identified that we can use the benefit of a, a professional. We're just waiting for that proposal, bringing it forward to that. Um, our full intent through the project manager is to provide regular updates to council on any milestones such as receipt of various studies when they come in, um, as well as uh, updating council on um, negotiations with regard to community benefit. At the end of the day, obviously it will be council that will need to consider uh, any community benefits recommendation and a community benefit agreements for approval. So those would ultimately come through for council in public session for consideration, debate, discussions, and things like that through that process. So that's the intent. Obviously the details we need to work out with the project manager on how they would like to do that when uh, they get on board, but that's our intent. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, because we were just talking about SkyDev, I wanted to ask a question related to that. Uh, recently, uh, a number of trees were removed from the property, but there's still a, a row of trees along Fuller Street that would be uh, municipal land. And I know that little buffer would be really important to uh, the neighbours of that project. I just wondered if we know if those trees are intended to be removed or if they will be uh, remaining on uh, that municipal property. Um, so uh, Denise could probably add to this, but those trees were removed under a permit due to uh, remediation on site. Um, the consideration of the rest of the trees surrounding it will be tied to and reviewed as part of the detailed engineering with regard to uh, the rest of the works and appropriateness of them and how they fit in. And so it'll be reviewed, but they'll stay in for now. And um, that process uh, will determine the well, hopefully if we can keep them or or some of them or what the replacement would be but it'll be part of that process once we know detailed external works required any other questions seeing none then uh, or inquiries uh we'll move on to uh our uh, consent agenda and there's nothing on it today so i think we're ready to move into items for consideration and uh, there are a few things here. Um, a is the uh, 2023 budget. Um, B is the uh, 
DWQMS commitment and endorsement of the, sorry. Yeah, um, the consent agenda, there is none. You, um, you would do these individually, Mr. Mayor. Oh, uh, you don't need to go through them all. <laughs> Perfect, okay. Then uh, uh, let's uh, look at item one then. Uh, the recommendation is be it resolved that bylaw 2023-19 being a bylaw to adopt the budget estimates of revenues and expenditures for all sums for the year 2023 be taken and read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed. Do you have a mover and seconder for that? Moved by Councillor Forder, seconded by Councillor Bartley. Discussion? You're ready to vote on the budget. All in favor? Passed. Um, item B is a recommendation that Council of the Municipality of Meaford approve the commitment and endorsement of the Meaford Drinking Water Quality Management System Policy and Operation Plan. Mover and seconder for that. Uh, moved by Councillor Yurik, seconded by Councillor Greenfield. Discussion? No questions? All in favor? Item C is the uh, Coffin Ridge license endorsement. The recommendation is that Council of the Municipality of Meaford support the request of Coffin Ridge Boutique Winery Inc. and endorse their application to obtain a manufacturer's limited liquor sales license. Mover and seconder for that, uh, Councillor Bell and uh, Councillor Bartley. Discussion on this uh, at all? It's uh, amply... Uh, uh, you know, uh, elucidated in the <laughs> in the paperwork we read. So, all in favor? Thank you. It's carried. Uh, finally, item D is a recommendation that uh, Council of the Municipality of Meaford one authorize the Treasurer, Director of Financial Services, to transfer twenty one thousand dollars from the Accessibility Reserve to fund the remaining portion of the Accessibility Ramp. Second, approve the award of PF 2023-01 accessible ramp at Market Square to Sealy and Arnil Construction for $79,346.34, including the municipality's non-refundable allocation of HST. And third, authorize the mayor and clerk to enter into the necessary agreement. Mover and seconder, moved by Councillor uh, Greenfield, seconded by Councillor Forder. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Councillor Olson, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And I know there's been some discussion about uh, this question already, but just uh, I think for uh, the sake of, of the uh, public uh, present and, and listening and recognizing that there is some uh, conversation uh, underway about perhaps uh, doing some work at the Market Square and uh, recreating uh, an event space there? Um, and do we think the ramp is uh, in the right spot that will accommodate any of those future plans? Yeah, uh, thank you, Worship. Um, this is the most appropriate case uh, for the ramp at this point in time. Uh, we believe long-term uh, it is the, the right location as well and could be integrated into any long-term designs. Um, I know that should for some reason it not be in the right location, uh, the relocation of this, I think, would be very small in large percentage of the redevelopment of the market square, depending on the scope of the project, should it come forward. But staff are satisfied that uh, it is appropriate this time, as well as it being based on a grant, we need to proceed with it now. Okay. Uh, Councillor Greenfield. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor uh, Keevney, for, uh, uh, for mentioning that. This is something that uh, the Accessibility Committee has been uh, hoping for for, uh, I guess, about two years now. And uh, uh, quite often it has been mentioned at our meetings that, uh, uh, gee, I sure hope we can get that ramp built. Uh, we did get a grant for it. I, 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 think, uh, I think I just want to point out that uh, two years ago, we were looking at uh, $59,000. Today, we're looking at almost $80,000. And going back to the budget, I think this is just a perfect example of how municipal expenses have grown uh, over the past couple of years. And uh, 
I, I really want this to go ahead. I am a little nervous that uh, maybe it might, it might have a bit of an impact. I, I hope this doesn't mean that the rest of the market square redevelopment has to be built around the ramp to fit. Uh, but uh, hopefully we can accommodate uh, uh, everything in the future. And uh, we need to get this done. The grant, I think, is due to expire later this year. So uh, uh, hopefully we can uh, get this passed and, and get the work uh, started just in the very near future. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Mayor Kettner. I just want to comment. Uh, this is the only thing that made the news today on the radio station. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages in here on other stuff. And this little ramp made the news. Um, I wholeheartedly support it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I see no more questions. Uh, all in favor. And that is carried. Thank you. Would you like a short break? Or do you want to keep rolling on? Sounds like we keep rolling on. <laughs> um, so we uh, need a uh, uh, motion to move into committee of the whole. Uh, moved by Deputy Mayor uh, Keveny, seconded by Councillor Yurig. All in favor? Um, so we're going into committee of the whole at 2.45 p.m. And uh, the first item on the agenda is uh, in operations, item A, the Meaford and Leith Drinking Water Annual and Summary Reports. The recommendation that Committee of the Whole receive report OPS 2023-03 Meaford and Leith Drinking Water Systems Annual and Summary Reports for information purposes. Do we need a mover and seconder? Okay. Uh, moved by uh, Councillor Bartley, seconded by Councillor Greenfield. Uh, discussion. Uh, yes, Council Bartley. Thank you, uh, Mayor Kettner. It, it's an in-depth report. On page uh, 369 of the agenda, it says water loss of 19%. To me, that's really high. Is that abnormal? Oh, good. I was going to say, I, I uh, will defer to the expert in this situation. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's higher than normal for us, um, but it's not higher than other municipalities. Usually we're one of the ones on a better water loss. Um, our water loss is a very hard number to come up with. And last year with the work on Cook Street and draining and refilling our trunk main. It was a very hard number to figure out exactly. So we went on the more conservative side of the water loss, but we probably could have put extra cubic meters in there as well as draining our water tower, refilling it, overflowing it and other things. Those are all numbers we don't have meters on. So best guess. So hopefully that will drop for this year. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Yurig. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, yeah, it's gripping reading, um, <laughs> but extremely important. Thank you. It was a good report. Um, one question is an umbrella question is there was a, many references to um, record keeping on a regular basis and keeping it for 10 years, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just wondering, are the reports all hard copy and electronic? And several of them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, I just wanted to make sure the that that was the case. Nightmare. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is doing daily um, testing and reporting, et cetera. So just want to make sure that was done. And, and obviously then the 10 year, anything that's electronic, you don't care about a storage of 10 years hard copy is one thing, but I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Other questions, Deputy Mayor Keveny. Thank you, Worship. And I just wanted to add, Emily, how fortunate we are to have our staff in the water department. I mean, we as council are responsible for water, which is a huge burden, but it does not keep me up at night. I don't know about anybody else, but I don't worry about it consistently because we have such great staff in place. So thank you for thank taking you. care of our water and allowing us to sleep well at night. Uh, Councillor Greenfield. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, and uh, through you to, uh, uh, to our water lady. Uh, um, 
these uh, these audits uh, by SAI Global and Taveras uh, are, are are those uh, companies appointed by the ministry, or do we get to choose them? How how does that work? I know we've I, I think we've had them both previously. I, I just wondered uh, how how they are uh, uh, picked or for you, Mr. Mayor. I think that's on the next report, but I can answer it now. Um, the audit ones is the, the one is mandated by the ministry. Um, that's the SA Gli SAI Global. Um, and then the other one we hire because we just don't have the staff to be able to audit ourselves. Any other questions? You ready to vote on uh, item B? Uh, all in favor? And then I think we have uh, one more here. The uh, am I correct? Uh, the uh, 2022 DWQMS management review and audit results. The recommendation that committee of the whole receive the report uh, and audit results for information purposes. Uh, mover and a seconder for that. Uh, moved by Councillor Bell and a seconded by Councillor Forder. Uh, questions, discussion. Okay, all in favor. And that is passed. Thank you. Uh, updates from members uh, appointed to county council, committees, and local boards. I'm going to start with our uh, report from the deputy mayor on county council. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, county council did meet last Thursday, March the 23rd. Uh, began with the customary passing of meeting minutes. Uh, Dr. Era did speak to uh, council in the in relation to the current status of COVID in Great Bruce. Our numbers are very stable now after a bit of a bump last fall. There's zero outbreaks in any county-owned long-term care homes and hospitalizations are very low. A bylaw to enter into a Teague, a tax increment, I'm sorry, a tax increment equity grant with the town of Hanover was approved. 142 units of attainable rental housing are to be built with a proposed average market rate rent of $1,892. This grant is possible because of a provision within uh, the CIP improvement program. The grant will allow for the developer to be exempt from the county portion of the tax levy for the first year, then a gradual escalation will be in place for five years, after which full taxation will be required. This program assists developers with costs related to producing much needed attainable housing, and in this case, saving them $216,123.75 in county taxation. Al Leach delivered a very deliver. I'm sorry. Al Leach delivered a very informative presentation describing the attributes of the Children's Safety Village. After a year of virtual programming in uh, 2022, 2,100 children visited the site in 2023. Um, this is the only site of the 11 such villages in Ontario that provides farm safety education for children. The facility is now open three days a week and is typically booked every day with school class tours. County Council has supported the village financially for several years. Uh, Gray County ended 2022 with a surplus of $1,589,100, roughly 2% of the overall tax levy. The remaining mortgage for Golden Town here in Meaford will be paid and the rest will go into the county's one-time reserve to be utilized at Council's discretion. Uh, the Gray Road 7 reconstruction tender has been awarded to Harold Sutherland Walker Construction. The original budget was um, $8,210,400 and the bid came in at $6,412,216, so considerably under budget. Funds were to be drawn from DC charge reserves for this project, so the under budgeted funds will just remain in the DC reserve. Uh, Gray Road 7 from 2.85 kilometers south of Side Road 16C to Side Roads 2122B for a length of 6.6 .6 kilometers and Gray Road 40 to Side Road 4 for a length of 3.8 kilometers with 1.25 meters of paved shoulders and a culvert replacement as well are included in this tender. Um, so uh, a penalty of $1,000 a day will keep the construction on schedule. Uh, two other road projects came in under budget, but Director of Transportation Pat Hoy was quick to suggest this will not be the norm. 
Other projects ahead of council are looking to be over budget. Uh, considerable time was taken as well as two closed sessions as council discussed the financial impact assessment for the Rockwood Terrace long-term care reconstruction project in Durham. Council received the port report for information and considered whether or not to go forward with the full campus of care proposal with a price tag of close to $140 million or whether to continue with the 128 bed nursing home only. It was decided to go with this option at an upset cost of $92 million. The province will contribute a significant portion of these funds, but there still will be an increase to the county level to the county levy for the next 25 years to cover debenture payments. The new Rockwood Terrace is located on a 30 acre parcel owned by the county. So there's potential for revenue generation from the remainder of the site. But this, this is a huge number for the county, $92 million. And as we know, we've also been considering the redevelopment of Greg Abel's and Markdale. And that certainly is put on the back burner because this is, uh, this is just a massive project. And as Councillor Greenfield has spoken to increased uh, supply chain costs, labor costs, and all the rest of it, this, uh, this cost has uh, really escalated. It was brought forward that, um, what year was that, your worship, that this project could have been built for like $27 million, just not very many years ago. So uh, yeah, huge increase. But anyway, it's a go forward. Thank you. I'd just like to add to that, that uh, it's terribly disappointing, but uh, basically, as, as one councillor pointed out, uh, you're asking 100,000 people to borrow $108 million. And it uh, it just uh, isn't uh, justifiable, and it just makes me so, uh, you know, uh, feel so lucky that we have a new long-term care uh, on, on the private sector side in Meaford, which uh, I think is just you know smashingly attractive inside and out, uh, and it's it's really uh, disappointing that the county is having to step back from a plan that they've had for years, so it's. Um, what about the uh, Grace Sabo Conservation Authority? Is you got a report? Could I ask a couple of oh, county, by, by county means, related yes. questions? Sorry. If I may. Well, well, first of all, I just want to mention the, uh, the deputy mayor is correct. I, I think the, the first figure I heard for Rockwood a few years ago was about thirty million, and uh, wow, um, I had two or three people from the. Uh, the hamlet of Bogner contact me and they are concerned. Uh, they have heard through the grapevine that County Road 18 from Rockford to the Bogner cutoff, uh, County Road 29, is going to be completely closed for part of the summer. <laughs> I, I don't think that's going to happen. Can you? Help me on that. Is there uh, is there anything planned on on that stretch from Rockford to East? Um, not that I'm aware of, but I will certainly uh, look into that. And any of the road construction that was discussed, uh, we were told that one lane will be kept open, and that uh, that is the priority to keep the traffic moving. So uh, no, I'll look into that though, Councillor Greenfield. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bartley. I think on the, that's the dairy line, Harley. They're doing from concession four, and it's on that contract that was just passed through the county from four up to there. They're, they're going to raise that swamp two or three feet, but it's going to be one lane. Uh, it is going to be slowed down. But it... Do we have a, sorry, go ahead, uh, Councillor Forder. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And through you, uh, I have updates uh, from the Mifa Public Library. Uh, so we did meet last Wednesday, uh, both Councillor uh, Greenfield and I were in attendance, and we began by uh, getting a notice of implementation of a library uh, strategic plan, which is currently in the works and will be presented to the library board in the near future. In accordance with town bylaw, library board has appointed a couple of standing committees and will establish a board policy on library CEO performance review, as we currently do not have one in place. Uh, so we had individuals appointed for the Finance and Personnel Committee, also the Governance and Policy Standing Committee. Uh, we also had four of the library staff attended the Ontario Library Super Conference uh, last month, and the attendees uh, compiled a report of their favorite sessions to share with the rest of um, library staff, 
big favorites included sessions on uh, diversity and inclusion, and also uh, queerifying the catalog. The Owen Sound North Grade uh, Union Public Library Board updates, uh, they did meet on March 9th. They have uh, three new members and they will be setting up boards and committees at the next meeting. There was also a good amount of discussion related to the increased rates in violence in Ontario public libraries and other public institutions. And while thankfully the, our public library hasn't had many serious issues, uh, the Owen Sound Public Library has been experiencing an increased rate of violent incidents, um, which is a growing cause for concern for the safety of library staff, visitors, and everybody else. Uh, also sort of ties into uh, mental health. Uh, so there are mental health resources uh, available at the Meaford Public, Public Library, including pamphlets. Uh, in addition to the mental health walk-in support clinics every Wednesday from 1 to 3 p.m., you can walk in for referrals, uh, get resources, and uh, get mental health support. This is free and there is no appointment necessary. Another cool thing was um, uh, our own uh, CAO uh, shared an article from uh, the recent issue of Azure Magazine. The article was titled, Can Public Policy Fix Canadian Architecture? This is regarding the circular economy featuring the, our library and how it is a prime example of sustainable architecture. And this article will actually be featured in Meaford Public Library's next newsletter. Um, it's a very interesting read. Uh, some interesting stats uh, from the library from February. There were 266 uh, public computer logins. Uh, the facility bookings were at 113, so that was a very uh, busy thing. Library visits were up to almost 5,600. And uh, slightly down, tech center visits were at 28. Um, I love this library. There's so much happening here. Just a few highlights of uh, some really cool things that are happening for April. Starting on April 1st at 11 a.m., we have children's author Carolyn J. Morris. She will be hosting an interactive story time and will also bring a bunch of baby chicks uh, as well, which is super cute, and I'm hoping to be there. Uh, Saturday, April 8th, from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m., the library is hosting an Easter egg uh, scavenger hunt. Uh, the 2023 Grey Bruce Youth Film Festival returns this year for grades 7 to 12. This is coordinated by the Owen Sound North Grey Union Public Library. Submission deadline is May 12th. And for more information, uh, go to meford.ca slash library. On Thursday, April 13th at 2 p.m., uh, right sizing for retirees. You can join real estate broker Haley MacArthur as she discusses the steps to successfully downsizing your home. Registration is required in advance. This event has huge demand and may already be full. Uh, Saturday, April 22nd from 1 to 3 p.m. This one's very interesting. Trout Unlimited's Yellowfish Road Water Quality Program for kids age 6 to 12. This program reminds Canadians about their responsibility to reduce stormwater pollution, which is one of the largest sources of freshwater pollution in Canada. This program has two main components, the first being discovery, participants find their local water supply and then explore how hazardous waste can enter uh, this uh, water source. And secondly, action, participants make a difference by painting yellow fish near storm drains to serve as a reminder that any materials entering the storm drain um, do have an effect on our water resources. Free registration for this is required. Now, there's also free tax clinics. Uh, so if you need a hand to prepare your tax return, there are volunteers that can help you prepare your tax, uh, your income tax and benefit return. If you have modest income in a simple tax situation, these volunteers are not employees or volunteers of the CRA. There are 10 dates in April for this clinic. Appointments are required. This has been extremely popular as March was completely booked up and April is almost full, if not already. Wednesday, April 12th and 26th from 1 to 3 p.m., a Service Canada representative will be available to provide advice or guidance on accessing Service Canada programs and services related to employment insurance, Canada Pension Plan, and old age security. These are virtual appointments, 30 minutes long, and they are held at the library. Appointments are required in advance for that. And uh, finally, there is an author talk on Thursday, April 27th at 6.30 p.m. Ted Glenn, who is the author of A Very Canadian Coup, 
which uh, is a book focusing on the life and times of Mackenzie uh, Bowell, Canada's fifth and least understood prime minister and his sixth ministry, including the January 1896 coup. Um, and that is just a few examples of what is happening at a very busy community hub known as the Meaford Public Library. And again, we are so lucky to have this facility. Um, Councillor Yurig. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, uh, Councillor Bell and I attended a very lengthy Gray Sable Conservation Authority meeting uh, last Wednesday. Like Council, we're undergoing a fair amount of training, and it was it was um, very informative. I'll kind of piggyback on Mr. or Vanderveen's presentation today because we did get a report on the watershed uh, health review. Um, so they looked at stream health, forest conditions, wetland wetland conditions, and groundwater. And the good news is is that um, our conservation authority reports that we're in very good condition, particularly in comparison with Southern Ontario uh, conservation authority. So we're uh, we're pretty lucky that way. There was also a, an environmental planning report, um, and it noted of note in that was the Blue Mountain and Meaford. Planning applications, obviously the volumes are increasing and conservation authorities have to be very cognizant of that. Um, interesting thing that was mentioned was talking about uh, invasive Phragmites, which is pretty prevalent in parts of the uh, municipality. And the GSCA actually has tools for loan. So if you're having issues or uh, any of our um, agricultural friends or rural friends are having issues, there are actual sprays and tools that uh, they can access through the GSCA to utilize to help combat that. Um, a few uh, announcements coming from uh, GSCA. On June 24th, uh, there's going to be the 50th anniversary uh, celebration for the Friends of Haibu. Um, so it's going to be ten dollars. It'll be organized by the Friends of Haibu with the assistance of the GSEA staff. So that's just a. Uh, there's going to be um, likely fireworks and music and festivals. It'll start at four. They'll clear out the day uh, day visitors, and then that evening will be a special celebration. So good way to celebrate a local landmark. Uh, as well, there's the Gray Sobble Day Camp, um, which would, is actually scaled down a little bit this year, again, because of so much trouble, difficulties finding um, staff. We all know how difficult it is to find qualified staff members to uh, facilitate these things, but it will still be going on from July to September this year. And finally, on April 20th, there will be a film festival. Um, so those things can all, more information can also be found at the Grace Hubble Conservation Authority website, uh, but, or they could reach Mr. Bell or myself to get more information on those. Thank you. Anything further on, um, on the boards and committees? Uh, Councillor Bell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So last Thursday, um, I attended the Gray County Farm Safety Association. We're making uh, preparations for this coming Thursday, and we uh, determined who would be the lead speaker for promoting Gray County Farm Safety Association. Okay. Um, I think we're ready then to move out of Committee of the Whole. Do I have a motion? Um, Councilor Yurig, second by Deputy Mayor. All in favor? And moving on, uh, is there any uh, notice of motion today? Seeing none, we do have a couple of motions for decision. And the first is uh, uh, yours, uh, Councillor Greenfield. Would you like to uh, move it? Sure, okay. So I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to you, uh, Councillor Greenfield, to read your motion if you would. and. Uh, Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Yes, I, I, I will read it. I, I wasn't going to, but I got a bit of publicity <laughs> uh, beforehand, so I, uh, I, I will read it um, and, and make a couple of comments on it, if I may. Whereas in 1840, David Miller constructed a cabin near the mouth of the Big Head River, whereas over the next 34 years, the community, which became known as Peggy's Landing, grew in importance and population becoming the social and economic center of the area. Whereas in 1874, by a special act of the Ontario legislature, the urban area of 1700 persons was proclaimed to be known now as the town of Meaford. Whereas the town has grown to include over 4,500 inhabitants and was on January 1st, 2001, 
united with the townships of Sydenham and St. Vincent to become a part of the town of Georgian Highlands and shortly later, the municipality of Mefer. Whereas the year 2024 will mark the 150th anniversary of the urban area that is still commonly referred to as the town of Mefer. Therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the Municipality of Meaford hereby recognize the sesquicentennial significance of the town and that requests be distributed to attract members for a one-time citizens task force and various funding sources be investigated to commemorate the anniversary in 2024. And if, if I just... Uh, May your worship concerning the uh, uh, the notice. Uh, I, I've come from information that the the population in the urban area may be closer to forty seven or forty eight hundred people now, uh, as opposed to forty five hundred. And I'm sure council members noticed a uh, a spelling mistake uh, in. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I I did that deliberately. Uh, put two T's in shortly. Uh, uh, Mr. Smith suggested that I capitalize it, and uh, I, I think it's it, it's it's only reasonable that uh, uh, I I take a minute to to mention uh, the the first mayor of the municipality of Meaford, uh, Mr. Gerald Short, and uh, I. Uh, Gerald, uh, I understand, was on municipal council for 32 years, and uh, he was a remarkable uh, uh, local politician, and uh, I, I just thought that uh, well, there should be some reference to, to Jerry for, uh, uh, for all the work he did. Okay, I... Uh, that's great. I uh, hope for some comments, suggestions. I'm I'm very open to uh, to anything. Uh, Councillor Bell. Yeah, please. And uh, anyway, uh, Councillor Greenfield, I I certainly am going to get behind this. Uh, what you brought forward for us today, Mr. Mayor, I did ask you ahead of time for a couple of extra minutes, if I may. And I alluded uh, earlier today when we had Imagine Meeper come, and this was the third and final revision of when our new coat of arms was being developed. And in uh, your motion, uh, Carly, you've said about having a, a working group. And I just want to say, I fully support having a really good robust working group. When we went through the new coat of arms, we had Mayor Barb Plumpus. We had yourself as the deputy mayor, Harley Greenfield, myself, well-known Marjorie Davidson. We had John Kerr, a local historian. We had Mr. Bill Murdoch, rest his soul. Francis Richardson, you mentioned, Gerald Short, and we had Linda Van Oltz. I make reference to some of the work that was done, and I've kept all of the work that that group did. And there was something that in Harley, in your, in your bringing this forward, you said about 1840, there's, there's records at Gray County that go back to 1818. And then there's reference uh, Gray County of uh, 1833 when uh, Rankin was doing surveying. But one thing here, I just want, I just chose one page about the town itself says there was an unveiling of a historical plaque downtown Market Square, Wednesday, July the 13th in 1966. And the reason for that was the plaque commemorates the founding of Meaford in 1845. We have, a lot of, we have a lot of history that ties a lot of things together in our community, which now makes up our great municipality. Just a couple of other quick lines from all of these notes that the town of Meaford was never a village, but was an act of parliament to be made known as a town. And it came into effect July 1, 1874. And the first council was elected in January of 1875. The township of St. Vincent 
at its first election in 1851. And over in Sydenham in 1850, they were incorporated. And actually back then, Sydenham was the town, the center of commerce for Sydenham. And it wasn't until 1857 that Owen Sound came into being. So we have a lot of tremendous history in our, in our municipality. And I wanna get behind you, Harley, on this 100%. I have a very small, couple of very small changes to what you have brought forward. And I hope that you will go along with it and my fellow councillors will go along with it. I would like to amend your motion by adding a clause between clause five and clause six. Clause five begins with, whereas in the year 2024, I'd like to uh, have it say that, whereas the geographic townships of St. Vincent and Sydenham celebrated their sequentials in the year 2000, to add that, and at the very end, just add this, that the celebrations should be inclusive of the entire municipality. So I, I get behind you on this, Harley, and if this council will adopt those two little things, I think it'll keep us united, and I think it'll make for promotion. And uh, aside from everything, I like a good party. So uh, I can really get behind you on this one, Harley. Thank you. I'm, I'm quite pleased with those amendments, uh, Your Worship. I, uh, I would be glad to have them as uh, part of the uh, script. Thank you. Fine. And uh, do you second them then, or, <laughs> or is that proper? Do you want do you, do you want another seconder? Maybe okay. Uh, who yeah. would like to second it? I seconded the motion, and I will second the uh, amendments on the condition that uh, Councillor Bell brings his guitar to the party. <laughs> <laughs> And just, uh, I, I guess we'd better vote on this. Uh, uh, are you any more discussion? All in favor? Thank you very much. I just add, uh, when I was elected in 2018 as a councillor, uh, Gerald Short showed up at my door one evening and said, Ross, I have something that I want you to keep in safekeeping. And it was a number of flags. So I will turn them over to the committee and uh, i'm not sure just their significance but i knew it was important to hang on to them so um sorry sorry yes. your worship uh, uh we've mo voted on the amendment but we'll have to vote on the main motion oh sorry thank you for keeping us uh you know we're, we're all getting a little nostalgic here so <laughs> uh, especially the older ones of us so um uh, all in favor of the amendment the, okay, so now to vote on the, the motion, all in favor, and it is carried, thank you. And then we have um, a motion uh, from Deputy Mayor Keaveny, and if you would like to present it. Thank you very much, Your Worship. put it on the floor, don't we? Yes, so uh, well, we need, I will move it, and if there, if anyone. Uh, Councillor Bell, all in favor? No, we're nope, going to talk about right. it. We just have to talk about it, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Your Worship. And, and I, I think I, I won't opt to read the motion. I think everybody has it in front of them and, and is familiar with it. But I I do feel that it is, is important to bring this forward at this point in time after the uh, decision at Gray County, uh, which uh, was in regards to Bridges 21 and 22, that they uh, do not feel uh, responsible because they never have had uh, any... Uh, any opportunity or need or been required to or felt that they were uh, necessarily uh, owners of these bridges, nor have they maintained them in any way, shape or form. So because that happened, I felt it was important that we come forward with a motion here at our own municipality just to determine uh, what's next. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that there'll be support around the table so that staff can have a look at this and bring back a report to us with uh, some recommendations as to uh, how we should proceed uh, from this point in time. So if uh, anyone has any comments or questions. Councillor Bell. 
Thanks once again, Mr. Mayor. And I, I get behind you on this, uh, Deputy Mayor Keevney. I, uh, I pulled out the report of the state of the uh, infrastructure bridges, and uh, that was produced for us in uh, 2014, 2015. But back in the day, 21 and 22, uh, they were added up together uh, of around $2 million. We've got quite a we got quite a struggle ahead of us, uh, even financially. But there is one thing that I I do want to uh, to bring forward, and it was from Farm Safety. This is typical of some of the large farming equipment that travels down our road systems. These bridges are a big impact to our farming rural agricultural commitment. And what can happen is the next photograph, which is tragic. I have a photograph of a tractor rollover. Somebody didn't get to go home. We're forcing the agricultural community to use an alternative route to get around these bridges. And I'm gonna back you, Deputy Mayor, to work with you and this council to do everything we can to see that we can't get them open have conversations with our neighbors in Chatsworth. They have often said they never got a number and they weren't happy talking about something without a number. And even if we get something from our neighbors, we would count that to be awesomely terrific. And uh, it is sad that Gray County uh, moved in the direction that it did, but I am gonna get behind you on this one because of this very thing. This is important for the sake of a bridge. Thank you. Councillor uh, Greenfield. Thanks, uh, Your Worship, and thanks, uh, Deputy Mayor Keeney, for uh, keeping this keeping this alive. Uh, uh, I, I, I hope it hasn't got into the faint hope uh, section yet, uh, but I know the uh, odds are stacked against us. Just, uh, in, in addition to what Councillor Bell has mentioned, uh, the fact that these bridges have not been open to any kind of traffic in, in the past, uh, but will uh, refer to farm traffic, is that the hill on Concession 2 has had to be used more and more often. And um, I don't like to admit that this, but that hill has many, many challenges. Uh, and uh, I would hate to see something like that tractor roll over be caused uh, by somebody trying to uh, uh, get farm machinery or, or a car or a truck uh, up, up that hill, but particular farm machinery. It could happen. And if those bridges were were open, there's a distinct possibility that the chances of of some kind of a tragedy would decrease substantially. So this is it, it's not just about those two bridges; it's that whole that whole neighborhood and uh, and the fine people who try every day to make their living out of a, a very difficult industry. Thank you, Councillor Bartley. Thank you, uh, Mayor Kettner, and thank you, Shirley, for bringing this forward. Everybody in the room knows how I feel about bridges. Um, picture Tony showed wasn't what I was about to say. My neighbor Ed Tottenham killed himself. Tractor rolled over on a hill south of us. Uh, it was in the town of Chatsworth. It was their hill. He killed, he killed himself because the hill was too steep. Rolled over and killed himself. So there's the town of Chatsworth with a death. They eventually, they, I don't know how many, much money they spent. They took the top of the hill out, put it at the bottom, reconstructed the road for the simple reason so it wouldn't happen again. And here, here's another situation arose in Bogner. And Chatsworth doesn't want to come up with the money. And I know they're not going to come up with enough money to fix this. It's sad that they're going to put dollars ahead of life when they've already had the situation. Um, I've knocked my head out trying to talk them into it, and they're just not going to come up with the money that's going to do it. So unless we 
sue the county to get them involved. I don't see where this goes, but I will support today's thing to see if we can't move this forward. I, I am very skeptical, but I hope we can. Thank you. Any further discussion, questions? All in favor of the motion and it's passed. Thank you. I think now we're looking at the um, adoption of minutes uh, for the uh, council meetings of March 6th and 13th. Um, do we need a motion? We do. Uh, mover and seconder, moved by Councillor Greenfield, seconded by Councillor Forder. Uh, any discussion? All in favor of adopting these minutes? Carried. And uh, moving on now to communications. Um, are there any questions or discussion of the uh, Bogner Hall Community Board minutes? Um, minutes of Gray County Council and Committee of the Whole for March 9th. And lastly, the uh, correspondence list. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Councillor Yorig. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would like to pull for discussion um, item four, which is from the Chatham Kent municipality regarding uh, reducing municipal insurance costs. It's just, uh, it's a, to me, it's a worthy thing to at least support. They're just asking for support because it's like every other municipality and not just municipality but everybody is just facing multiple double digit increases and so what they're asking for is um support from other councils uh because they are going to be forwarding um correspondence to uh the, the um the government to petition against this kind of thing so i would like to see our council kind of show support for that uh that their motion to uh, to echo this is an evergreen subject, and we uh, we keep uh, you know supporting those motions. Uh, so, do you want to move that? Uh, yes, I would move that 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 we uh, do that. Yes, seconder, uh, Councillor Forder. Any further discussion? All in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. Now, at this point, uh, we need to move into uh, a closed session as we consider the Community Builder Award. So um, I think uh, we're going to adjourn temporarily and come back when we uh, finish that conversation. That's perfect. Yes, thank you. We would just need a mover and a seconder to go into the closed session, please. Uh, moved by Councillor Yurig, seconded by uh, Deputy Mayor Keveny. All in favor? And we will adjourn. Uh, return shortly. Thank you.
So just the reporting out of our closed session that we only discussed the matter of the Community Builder Award. Uh, the other thing that we have to uh, tidy up today is our confirming bylaw. The recommendation is that uh, uh, bylaw 2023-20 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Municipality of Meaford at its regular and special meetings held in the month of March 2023 be taken as read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. Uh, we need a mover and seconder. Uh, moved by Councillor Bartley, seconded by Councillor uh, Forder. Any discussion? Otherwise, all in favour? And that is carried. And that concludes our uh, uh, business today, and I declare this meeting adjourned.